Diabetes Connections is brought to you by Animus Corporation, providing insulin delivery products for people living with diabetes and part of the One Touch family. And by Dexcom, take control of your diabetes with the world's first continuous glucose monitoring system that sends glucose readings directly to your compatible smart device. Live life on your own terms with Dexcom. Hey, it's Stacy. This podcast is not intended as medical advice. I'm not a doctor. You know that. If you have those kinds of questions, please contact your health care provider. This is Diabetes Connections with Stacey Sims. This week, open APS, looping, hat, a bunch of weird sounding terms that are changing the way many manage their diabetes. We'll take a look at what some really smart people are doing to push existing technology and give us all more choices. Uh, it's brilliant. It's the fact that we have this choice, and the choice is carry on doing what you want to do, so what you're doing, the fact that you can choose to do something different and amazing, and that's, that's the, the most amazing part of it. If you go back two or three years, we didn't have choice. It was a pump or MDI, that was it. Now, look what you can do. Tim Street joins me to explain and compare the open source systems. He's tried almost all of them. Plus, it's Diabetes Podcast Week. Lots of great shows coming together to help a terrific charity. I'll talk about Spare a Rose and how you can help. It all starts now on Diabetes Connections. Welcome to another week. I'm Stacey Sims. If you're new to the show, we aim to educate and inspire through stories of connection, talking to movers and shakers in the diabetes community, as well as everyday people, just taking it day by day with type 1. My son was diagnosed 10 years ago, just before he turned 2. I am a former local TV anchor and radio show host based near Charlotte, North Carolina. And this is Diabetes Podcast Week. It's something I thought of and put together last year for the first time, bringing together all the shows, all the podcasts about diabetes, mostly type 1, but open to all, to raise awareness of podcasting. A lot of people still haven't heard about podcasting and they don't know where to find us. But, you know, it it is such good support. It's another way of getting support and help and and being part of this community. And now we want to help a very worthy charity. I'm excited to tell you all about Spare a Rose and how you can help. A big supporter of this campaign since the very beginning, since Spare a Rose was formed, has been Johnson & Johnson and Animus. Quick word from Animus, our sponsor. We put a lot of thought into choosing our son's Animus One Touch insulin pump nearly 10 years ago, and just as much thought each time we decided to stay with Animus One Touch. Our insurance has always covered a new pump every four years, so we have stayed with Animus One Touch three times now. Why? Well, the product is exactly what we want out of an insulin pump. Animus One Touch offers a choice so you can choose the pump that suits your individual needs. Customer service is incredible, and Animus One Touch pumps fit my son's very active lifestyle. To find out more, go to diabetes-connections.com and click on the Animus part of the One Touch family logo. Sphere Arose is a very clever campaign to address a very real and dire problem. Diabetes in developing countries can be a death sentence. This Valentine's Day, consider donating the cost of just one rose. That one rose, that cost, can keep a child with type 1 alive for a month. A dozen roses, that cost can cover a year. I have a lot more information and links at diabetes-connections.com. The money goes directly to Life for a Child, which is an international diabetes federation program. And they write that living with type 1 diabetes can be challenging wherever you live. But in some countries, life-saving insulin, management tools, and education are entirely unaffordable or even unavailable. Life for a Child partners with diabetes centers in these countries to supply young people with these vital components for life. We are working toward the vision, no child should die of diabetes. And the Spare Rose campaign, they go on to say, shows that the diabetes online community takes care of one another both online and off and around the world. And, you know, the irony of asking for the simplest tools, I mean, we're, we're talking about test strips and meters and insulin. I mean, that's what, that's what they're giving these kids. 
talking about that, the basics at the beginning of an episode about high tech do it yourself solutions to diabetes management is not lost on me. I know the cost of diabetes is already high, but if you can afford it, if you have insulin in your fridge and you have technology on your body or your kid's body, and you can afford a, an extra couple of bucks here, please consider donating. Links at my website and all of her social media. I'm going to have links upon links on this. And a huge thanks to Julie at Wild Tree here in Charlotte. You're going to hear more about that later on. But she and her company have made a significant donation to Spare a Rose. And we're going to give them some love today later on in the show. And you can go to diabetes-connections.com and click on the Wild Tree logo to learn more about her. More to come really all month long on Spare a Rose, and we will get to Tim Street and the high-tech stuff I know people are really interested in as well in just a moment. Um, Now from Dexcom, though, we've been dealing with type 1 diabetes for 10 years now. Benny was diagnosed in 2006, just before he turned two. I'd heard about the teen years, but like a lot of parents, I thought we would be different. Ha 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 ha. Well, here we are. (laughs) And here come some incredible physical changes and the hormone swings. I cannot imagine managing diabetes during this crazy time without the Dexcom continuous glucose monitoring system. We can react more quickly to highs and lows, adjust insulin doses with advice from our endocrinologist. I know the G5 Mobile is helping to improve Benny's A1C. CGM-based treatment requires finger sticks for calibration, may result in hypoglycemia if calibration not performed or symptoms expectations do not match CGM readings. For more information, go to Dexcom.com. My guest this week is Tim Street. He's lived with type 1 for 28 years, and he writes a blog called Diabetic, Diabet Tech. T-E-C-H. Get it? Diabetic. Tim says in his bio, I'm a technophile. I think like an engineer, even if I don't do a job like that anymore. In this blog, I pull together both the diabetes and the technology to try to determine what is really the art of the possible. And that's what I wanted to talk about with him today. The art of the possible. If you're a longtime listener, you know I struggle a bit with technology and I've even been scolded by some guests for that. But I know who I am, and not all of us are here to create our own closed-loop systems. Some of us are here to talk into a microphone. But during this interview, we go over a bunch of different systems, and there is a lot of assumed knowledge, even though I pop in and try to explain as we go. But you really may want to go and look at the links for this episode before you listen all the way through. Tim has a great explainer on his website, one of the reasons I wanted to talk to him about this. The basic idea here is that Several people over the last few years have taken existing devices, usually an older Medtronic pump and a CGM, usually Dexcom, and created different ways to have them communicate, therefore having the person wearing these devices, the person with diabetes, do less. I guess we'd call them hackers, right? But, you know, that word sounds a little bit negative. So I prefer do-it-yourselfers. And Tim is great. But the only time we could talk, he's over in the UK, so it really wasn't that easy to coordinate, was when he's at a pretty noisy coffee shop. Uh, We've done our best with the sound, but I do want to warn you, it's not perfect. But you can hear him just fine, and the information is great. Here's my chat with Tim Street. All right, Tim, thank you so much for joining me today. As my listeners know, I am not a technology expert, but I am very, very much interested in all of this technology, and I do think it's changing the face of how we all manage diabetes. So thanks for taking the time to jump on and talk to me today. No problem. Let me start, if I could, by just talking about your experience. So we're going to go through what a lot of these different systems are and, and what the components are. But what have you used, if that's the right terminology, in the last year or so? So um, if I give you a bit of a background as to how I got involved in the technology, um, it probably explains things a little bit better. Um, if you go back to the autumn of what was 2014 now, um, I initially had been looking at CGM systems and decided that they were way too expensive for what I could afford. And then Abbott came out with the Freestyle Libra in the UK, and I was one of the early adopters of that technology. And I ran with that for probably the best part of um, of 18 months, really. And in using that, I identified that perhaps there were other things that I was interested in doing. And as we were using it, there were people developing apps to 
allow it to upload data, for example, to Night Scout and a whole bunch of things like that. And I happen to have a meeting um, at an event in the UK with Tim Omer, who is the brains behind the hack, which is the Hackability Artificial Pancreas project. And I saw what he had been doing and had built this open loop system that picked up data from a Dexcom CGM system via Xtrip or Night Scout and was giving him directions as to what to do with his, um, with his basal based on the fact his pump didn't have any kind of communication techniques. I thought, wow, this is great. I want to do this. And that's kind of where I started moving into the I don't like the term, but artificial pancreas world with this HAP product. Okay. And uh, HAP is, as you said, it's H-A-P-P. That's right, yes. Okay. Um, if you go to my diabetic.com um, looping-a-guide page, it breaks down all of the options that are available at the moment. And HAP is one of the ones that is listed on there. It's a great way to get into using this kind of technology without ever having it closed loop. Excellent. Yeah, I definitely will link that up at my, my website when this runs. What were you using at the time? You had the Libre. What were you using, an insulin pump at that time? So I was initially on MDI, and I managed to, because of the process in the UK, getting an insulin pump isn't always straightforward. So I've had to, through surreptitious means, get myself an insulin pump that I was able to use. I borrowed it off somebody, essentially, with one of their older pumps. And I, I used that for six months prior to getting my own pump through um, the UK NHS process. Um, so I was using initially using HAP alongside the um, Roche Spirit Combo. Wow. How, how much of a difference did that make? Because you have had diabetes for a very long time. Yeah. Uh, I assume that things have changed quite a bit. It's been uh, 25 plus years. Yes, I'm 28 years now being type 1, and I think a big difference that the thing that made the biggest difference to me was really the leap and then the CGM stuff that went with that. Because that's what enabled me to understand what was going on with my body and with insulin. Um, so the then progress through the next stages of HAP and then closed loop were much easier as a result of having had that real time data. Um, what did the movement on the hat give me? What it did was it actually caught the raises in glucose levels happening before they got to a point where you start to notice them physically. So, for example, as it was picking up the, um, the, the continuous glucose data readings, once it started to, once you started to see a rise, it, it would buzz on the watch on my wrist and say, you might want to increase your temporary basal rate now so that you can actually avoid going too high. So what it ends up doing is it ends up bringing you down into a much more, well, much less variance on your overall glucose numbers. So that whilst you might have a mean that, that equates to an HbA1c, say, of around 6%, instead of it ever getting particularly high, you stay within a standard deviation. I think you're probably already aware of the idea that if you have an average glucose level of 6.6, .6, you don't want your standard deviation to be more than 2.2, so more than a third of what your um, average is. And it enables you to keep that variance much tighter to your average because it's telling you to adjust things much earlier. And likewise, as you start to head down, it tells you to drop your glucose levels down to zero, sorry, your insulin levels down to zero, for example, much earlier than perhaps you would pick it up physically um, or you would have an alarm set on a Dexcom. So it, it, when you say buzzes on your wrist, just to be clear, this was not a completely automated system. It's telling you when you'd want to take action. That's right, yes. It's, it's as I described, an open loop, which means that it identifies things that need to be done and then tells you when you need to do them rather than doing them automatically. All right, so you, you used HAP for a while, the Hackability Artificial Pancreas Project, which, um, and I, again, I'm going to link this up at diabetes-connections.com, but it does require a, a certain set of hardware. You know, you need a, a Dexcom or a Libre sensor or um, right. something like that. You need Android and you need a pump. 
Um, yes, you do. Okay. So what, what made you move on from HAP to the but next I step? Hey, I'm jumping in here. Before we go back to the interview and learn what made Tim go to the next step, I want to tell you about Wild Tree. First of all, a huge thank you to Julie, the Wild Tree rep here in my neck of the woods near Charlotte, North Carolina, for a, an incredible donation to the Spare a Rose campaign. Uh, so appreciate that. Thank you for helping so many people with type 1 diabetes in the developing world. And I'll tell you what, I haven't talked about this on the show very much, but I hate to cook. I mean, really, I, I'm not very good at it. My husband is a great cook. He even owned and ran a restaurant for many years while I worked full-time in broadcasting. But, you know, we've changed things around a lot in the last few years. And I'm cooking probably 80% of our meals. And it was it was a chore. It wasn't fun. And, you know, nobody was eating very well. But then a friend of mine told me about Wild Tree, and I really love it. They are committed to developing products that fit the needs of your family, are easy to use, and taste great, and they really believe in the importance of creating nutritious dinnertime solutions. This isn't a dinner in the box with weird stuff your kids won't eat. You put together your own fresh produce and veggies with their super simple recipes and delicious spices, seasonings, or even blends. Family-friendly meals my kids and my husband will eat. I've got one in the crock pot right now as I'm recording this podcast. It is a fantastic chicken chili that my kids love. Plus, nutritional information with everything, which with type 1, you know we need. It comes in so handy. Learn more about Wild Tree and place an order with my friend Julie. She has made a big commitment to our community by donating to Spare a Rose. Check her out at diabetes-connections.com. And now back to Tim's answer about what comes after HAP. So I had received, as part of the process in the UK, the pump that I got properly funded was um, one of the Medtronic 640Gs. So those were the first ones that they did with predictive low glucose suspend mm. function. Um, and because I'd, I'd run with HAP for a bit with that, I then decided that I would, given that I was going to a number of festivals, I didn't want to carry around a large amount of hardware with me, which I was having to do with an extra wireless bridge, which connected the extra to the sorry, the Dexcom to the Android phone. Given I didn't want to do that, um, I ended up using the 640G's inbuilt um, CGM and using that to manage my any kind of lows and then having to observe what was going on for the highs. Um, and in the process of doing that, I came to the conclusion that it made more sense for me to look at an alternative, and I'd done some digging on the OpenAPS stuff, and as I was looking at it, there was OpenAPS and there was, at the time, LoopKit, which is the precursor to Loop, so it was the framework within which Loop was built. Um, but my pump didn't work with that, so I, I got to a point where I just made a decision, really, that I was going to go and try and find myself a pump that would work with these technologies had to go and try and find one, which is where MedWow um, came into play. What, I, what is MedWow? I read that on your website. It's kind of a like an eBay for medical devices. Ah. Um, so that's where you can pick up insulin pumps, but all sorts of other weird and wonderful things. <laughs> Well, it is interesting, we should note right now, that to run these systems that we're talking about, many of them, you need a Medtronic insulin pump that doesn't have the security that they built in a few years um, on into the pumps. In other words, they didn't want people necessarily being able to control the pumps themselves this way, so they've put some security in. I would I... argue that's not the reason for Oh, it. I'm sorry, go right ahead. I, I would suggest that that the mechanism by which these pumps allowed access wasn't it, was revealed to be, um, and I, I hesitate to use the term, a security weakness, um, by which it, I, I mean a particular hacker at a particular conference identified that you could identify this stuff and then do a whole load of work with it to potentially gain access to a pump. Now, yes, you can, but if you're a normal person using one of these pumps and you've turned off the remote functionality 
actually accessing the pump's quite hard from a, a wireless perspective. So well, the, the main reason for doing this was the FDA told them to, yes, rather, uh, yes. rather than any concern about people getting access to the pump to do things that they wanted to. Exactly. And I misspoke. I, I'm absolutely, we were on the same page. That's exactly what I thought because we, we've all heard about, well, we haven't all heard, but that hacker or whatever he wants to call himself who pointed out the flaw scared a lot of people. Yeah. Even though there's not been one case of someone doing anything like that with malicious intent, but right. by protecting it from some so-called bad guys, they also protected it from people who wanted to do more with it. And right. it's so it's almost ironic in a way, but so you had to go and get an older Medtronic pump. And yep. so obviously there's no warranty. There's, there's no real backup on that. No, absolutely. And then um, did you go ahead and, and start working with OpenAPS right away? So after having spent some time with the Medtronic um, and having a bunch of Enlight sensors, I, I actually went away and modified a piece of work that somebody had done to upload the Medtronic CGM data to Night Scout mm. so that I could collect the CGM data off the 640 and then um, use it alongside OpenAPS, all running on a Raspberry Pi, to act as a kind of a static artificial pancreas. So it wasn't really portable, but it was very, uh, it, it worked, which is the important thing. And I spent a couple of weeks of my summer holiday putting all that together and eventually getting it to work. So I was able to close the loop through the night and when I was around the house. Wow. Um, I'll just jump in and say a Raspberry Pi is, correct me if I'm wrong, a tiny little basic, basic computer, right? Yeah, that's right. It's, it's a very simple computer based on the same kind of chips that you see running in phones. What happened that first uh, night or so when you had closed the loop yourself? How did uh, you feel about it? I felt very pleased with myself. <laughs> like, yes, it works. I've kind of been running it during the day in proximity to without the pump attached to see how it worked <coughs> excuse me whether it did what i expected and i had a few days of doing that just making sure I was, I was observing it and i was happy with its behavior so that overnight it was like yeah okay let's turn it on and see how it goes and it worked and, and it wasn't like a spectacular difference because through my time spent using the various um real-time monitoring tools I've got my pump basal rates operating to such a level that actually it didn't make a huge amount of difference mm -hmm. um, to whether I was high or low overnight because my background insulin levels were okay anyway. During that holiday, what was useful was seeing it operate when I was eating things like um, fish and chips, which have a very elongated absorption profile, and then it, and it, then it handling those very well. So that was that was that was really where it became an interesting, beneficial product, where it was handling things that you would normally expect to see a, a rise, and you would guess a square wave um, on the pump to handle it. Instead, this ran alongside it and handled it for you. Now I'm a parent of a child with type one diabetes, so my situation is different. Um, yeah. I also have very little technical knowledge, as I shared with you. But someone like yourself. Um, who you know knew what you were doing at least enough to get through this process? Who had very good control to begin with? What what is the real difference for you to use something like this? Uh, it's basically time spent doing that in order to achieve good good control, good management. Typically, I use sugar surfing as the approach, and mm. you've probably heard of that from Stephen Ponder. Sure, um, sure. And it's a great technique. It, it's a very effective way of maintaining good glucose profiles, but it's time consuming. And if you consider that using it requires you to glance every 15 to 20 minutes and then think about an action, take an action, and then do it again 15 to 20 minutes later, so that throughout the course of the day, you are constantly glancing, constantly taking, making a decision based on the data presented to you. What doing this does is it takes that away. You no longer spend every 20 minutes looking at your CGM to decide what to do next because the loop is doing that. that that's just, it just sounds incredible. That's and, and, well, yeah, and I, I'd say that the, the amount, I, I estimated that the amount of time it actually gives you back on a monthly basis is, is probably an entire waking day of time. Yeah. 
I, I remember when my son was first diagnosed, and it was 10 years ago now, a little bit more than 10 years, my husband and I uh, thought a few weeks later, we thought we had added about two hours to our day every day. Of course, he was not yet two years old, my son, so, you know, it was a little different. And, if, and I don't think we spend two hours necessarily anymore, but that reduction of time, I'm, I'm jealous. I'm, I'm excited to hear about that kind of stuff. It's amazing. I mean, I think if you look at the feedback from the Medtronic tiles with the 670G, um, and also the people who have used both the Bigfoot and the Islet products. Again, the key thing that they fed back is that they get good control without having to do a huge amount of work to get good control. Mm. That's fabulous. All right, so let's move on to Loop. Um, we have actually talked about Open APS on the show before. We spoke with the developers, Dana Lewis and Scott Lybrand. Yep. And as you listen, I'd urge you to go ahead and look that episode up. I, I will link it up and make sure that it's very clear and easy to find. But they um, have added quite a bit since I last talked to them. Loop is is separate, correct? Can you take us through what Loop is? So, so Loop was built by um, Nate Rackler, um, and that's... I hope I pronounced his name right. I'm not 100% sure of that. And what he initially did was he was initially an OpenAPS user. And he took OpenAPS and modified it to fit how he wanted this kind of technology to work. So I believe he was um, an iOS developer or an Apple developer. So he took the, the OpenAPS code and worked with a couple of other people. Um, I think Pete Schwamm and Jim Matheson are two of those to build LoopKit, which is this um, framework that runs on an iPhone. And then Loop is the algorithm that he took, which is similar but different to OpenAPS. So what you have with Loop is a GUI that runs on an iPhone. It talks to the um, same set of Medtronic pumps using the Riley link, which was built initially by Pete to communicate between an iPhone and the pump for getting the data off it rather than for sending the communications to it. And he, or well, the two of them together, built Loop, which essentially gives you open, not open ABS, sorry, artificial pancreas type algorithmic technology plus bolus management off an iPhone. And before you go further, did you say a GUI on an iPhone? Yes. What so the, the app. Oh, it's an app. Okay. The app runs on the iPhone, but it has this iPhone GUI rather than something like Night Scout to enable you to use it, and you interact with it through that interface. And the interface is very nice to use. Is the main difference here then that it is, it's on an iPhone? It's easier to use for people who are used to iOS? Um, the main difference is that it, it's an app on an iPhone, mm -hmm. yeah, that it, rather than being something that runs on a um, separate system and that's a design decision that was made differently by the two different um, sets of developers um, and i can understand why when they built open aps it wasn't built to run on the iphone through some of the experiences i had with running loop on the iphone so it, it's it was a design decision to put it on the iphone and to run from an iphone as opposed to running it from a, a, se a separate if you like third party device mm. and have, you've used loop as well how, do, how does that compare it's, it's different um I, to be clear, I use OpenAPS with the um, advanced functionalities. So that's the advanced meal assist and the auto sense, which adjusts your insulin, your basal insulin rate dependent upon how it detects your insulin resistance on that day. Yeah, and I should jump in and say that's what I was alluding to. There are so many features that have been added since we first yeah. started talking about it. It's absolutely incredible. Uh, and those, I, I find those two things themselves brilliant. And then that's my main reason for using OpenAPS over Loop. But what, what Loop has is, is, the, is the portability. Um, it's very portable, and it runs off the iPhones. So you don't need to access something like Night Scout to run it, and that's really handy as well. Um, now, for me, the features outweigh the interface, and I'm not bothered about the way the bolus um, calculation works on Loop, which takes into account all your IOB, which obviously you, you can't do from... Open APS yes, because it doesn't do bolus. So what you also have on loop is this ability to bolus from your phone, which obviously as a parent is probably quite attractive mm. because it means 
as long as your kid is in Bluetooth range, which is what the Raylink uses, you can give them the bolus that you need to without having to pick up the pump and adjust anything on the pump. I, I'm I'm so almost speechless. I didn't realize that was part of it. That's yeah, that, really cool. That's something that people like a lot, and um, that that takes into account the insulin on board for many adjustments that Loop has made. The big difference in terms of how Loop for me, the big difference between how Loop and um, Open APS work in relation to bolusing, is that Loop has static carb absorption curves based on the amount of time you enter when you eat food versus open APS, which has advanced meal assist, and that estimates how much your, of the carbs you have eaten have been absorbed versus the bolus you've taken, and then modifies its action based on your absorption. Wow. So, wow. I, so I find the static absorption curves really difficult to get right, um, which is which quite a lot of people do. I mean, new users do find it a bit of a challenge getting that right. And with Loop, if you don't have your um, insulin absorption times, so duration of insulin actions, the right term, correct, you get your carb absorptions wrong, it can be oh, more sure. difficult to control it. So there's a bit more of a trial and error that needs to go on with Loop. And, and uh, forgive me, we've used the same kind of pump we've used in Animus Ping for 10 years. Um, that static carbohydrate absorption a rate, I would assume, is what is in that pump, is in most pumps, right? Is there a pump that has a fluid or an adjustable carbohydrate absorption rate? Um, probably not, but then it doesn't matter in the pump so much because it's not actually doing any calculations off it when it when you um, when it's delivering insulin. So you're if you look at what happens when you do a bolus on a pump. We're using the pump's bolus wizard. It doesn't take into account the basal insulin on board. It just looks at the previous um, bolus that has taken place. So it's operating in a different way. Got it. And from some of my questions, I'm sure you have um, assumed that I am not using these um, techniques yet, these devices. I'm fascinated by them, and I think they are changing the way we all look at diabetes and I think we all will be using similar uh, type devices like this, I hope, and not too far in the future. But what's the message here for people who don't feel comfortable with this kind of coding and, you know, building their own stuff? I mean, should we be encouraged by what's going on here and hope that the commercial pump makers get on board soon? Well, I think, I think it's fair to say that the commercial pump makers are very much looking at or already in this space. Mm. So we know, for example, that the 670G from Medtronic got FDA sign-off way ahead of um, expectation was in September last year. Mm -hmm, definitely. Uh, and that it's due out in April. Um, and there's a, there's a lot to be said for what happened with Open APS and the discussions that Dana and Scott had with the FDA and representatives that drove that sign-off being probably much quicker than it would have otherwise been. And the fact that you've got people like Bigfoot and Eilert out there um, going through the clinical trials, you've got Omnipod with their Horizon technology, I think it is probably due in 2018. These technologies are going to come through and you have a choice. Um, you have a choice. You can jump in, you can try and do it yourself, you can play with it, um, you can run it in an open fashion without actually making it do stuff on you to understand whether you like the idea of it or not, whether you think it does that. If you don't want to, you can wait for something from a, a provider that is clinically trialed officially amongst hundreds of people that has been signed off by the FDA um, that has full official approval, if you like. Um, either way, you get the ability to access that technology in the not too distant future pretty easily. I think what's going to be interesting for people is once you have a device that's capable of doing it, you then have to make the decision of whether you want to. And I think there's a psychological aspect to that that's quite interesting as well. Well, let's talk about that. What do you mean? So you could have it and but not use it, or people might be worried about giving it to a machine? Yeah, uh, and 
I've had discussions with a number of people about not being sure about whether they would want to give up, if you like, control mm -hmm. to an algorithm. Um, because pe people what are, are kind of, what if it goes wrong? What do I do then? And it's kind of the same thing as what happens if your pump goes wrong. Right. They have built-in safety control, built-in safety checks. They aren't going to be approved for use by the um, by the various regulators if they consider them to be a risk to use. So that's that's one of the key things. And at the same time, there's always the question about administering insulin anyway. I mean, if you think about it, type one diabetics are people who are administering a an extremely dangerous substance to themselves, or parents of type ones are administering an extremely dangerous substance to their children on a daily basis. Um, if you consider the amount of stress that people are under, and, and especially type 1 parents who are working, who are then um, dealing with having to manage their child overnight, maybe get suffering lack of sleep, is something that's doing that, making those decisions for you in a non-emotional way without stress, actually likely to be managing to do it more effectively than you are? I can't even imagine that. I mean, that to me is what I'm waiting for because my son has an, an insulin pump and a CGM and the idea that we're just waiting for the algorithm, it's its tantalizing. I mean, it really is so close. Um, I, I'm certainly one that would trust it and would really look forward to that stress relief. But it's a good reminder that these are still machines and you still have to have the inset. You still have to have the sensors. And, and those aren't perfect now. Have you had issues? I, I assume you've had mechanical issues just like anybody else. Um, so far, fingers crossed, <laughs> I've not had any pump issues. Um, you obviously, I don't think anybody who's pumping has ever not had a set issue. Right. Um, I, I've not had many, to be honest. I've, I've been using the Medtronic and um, other, well, the, I can't remember who makes them. There's a there's a specific company that makes the sets for both Medtronic and Animas. Hmm. I've used those sets for probably what we're talking about now, um, 18 months, and I've not had very many issues at all with them. But yes, you, you obviously get mechanical issues, tube blockages. They happen. They happen whether your pump is capable of doing decision making or whether your pump is simply delivering insulin. Um, what happens in the case of where your pump is actually able to make a decision or your um, self-built <laughs> software is able to make a decision is that after it happens, your self-built software will bring you back down to a comfortable level without you having to do very much. Whereas if your pump does it, you have to make the decision as to what you're going to do to try and get yourself there. That's a great point. That's, I would assume that the recovery time is a lot less because it's taking care of it. Well, it depends on the mechanism that the technology is using to get there. Um, typically, if you were resolving a high blood glucose level, you would give yourself a bonus. Whereas if, if these technologies are doing it, they have, will have safety limits, so they will probably not give you as much insulin in one hit. Now, the question is whether what you consider to be more safe, you consider a single larger shot that has the potential to drop you lower to be safer than um, a more slowly delivered series of smaller doses it's that that's the difference between the, the, the two decision processes really well and it's still you know it, it's kind of nice to know that there will still be human interaction i mean yes. you, you can always make that decision absolutely you can always decide to add more to something uh, can we talk just a, wait, before we go on i should say did we get all of the systems in i see on your website um android aps Yes, Android APS is um, one which has been built by um, a gentleman called Milos Kozak. Um, I think he's in Germany. He could be in Poland. Um, and it runs on an Android phone. Um, it's, a, a, again, a, another porting of um, Open APS, similar to Hack. But it runs with the Dana R pump, um, because the Dana R pump actually accepts a Bluetooth connection. And in jurisdictions where you can get Dana R's, it's actually quite a good option because it requires very little, um, very little product at all. So you could run the Dexcom G5 with the extra application on your phone, Android APS on the same phone, and the Dana R pump, and that would be everything. Yeah. I want to go ahead and just talk a little bit about 
about you and about Diabet Tech, which I don't know if I'm pronouncing it the way you say it, but the Diabetic. Diabet Tech, which is yeah. your website. Yeah. Um, and I, I'm curious, how did you start Diabet Tech? I mean, what what led you down uh, that road? Were you always interested in the technology? So I, I started off trying to write a blog and deciding that it wasn't doing a very good job of it. <laughs> um, and then I started to write about using the Libra and some of the stuff that I was finding with that and then some of the technologies that were available with the Libra um, and things like Glim and then the, the attempts that people were making to turn the Libra sensors into CGM rather than something that you scan. And as I started doing that, I started to pick up on various bits of research and people would ask questions. I thought, I keep seeing the same questions, so I'll just document the answers on my pages rather than on various forums. And as a result, it's kind of grown from that. So that as only have done things that are technology based, I've written about them on the website, um, produced them into, into this blog really, which has kind of grown with the various things that I've done. And then what's been really interesting is being able to be remotely involved in a number of the conferences that were going on and seeing some of the interesting non-pancreas technologies coming through. And by that, I mean some of the faster insulins and some of the technologies relating to um, insulin additives that potentially have a, a route to make the fast-acting insulin that we use way faster um, so that when you're looking at, you're talking about these artificial pancreas products, actually... They, when they operate, they operate really fast, and therefore you start to get something that looks much more like what happens in the body compared mm -hmm. to where we are now with the insulins available. I think that's been quite an interesting aspect to it too, has been seeing some of this, this innovation in other areas and then how that potentially interacts with the things that I've been very interested in. Yeah, that, I, that's fascinating. The, the newer and better insulins are, yeah. are just fascinating. I agree with you because I, I never realized, obviously, until my son was diagnosed, you know, how slow and how carefully you have to bolus for uh, yeah. anything. It's about, and a lot of people still aren't that aware of it. Mm. I mean, if you look at the advent of the Freestyle Libra in the UK and in Europe, the Facebook groups are full of people who have just started using it going, wow, I never realized a, how slow the insulin is, and B, how much in advance of eating I should probably be bolus. Right, right. And, and that's that's why faster insulins become much more interesting. And I think what if you look at the development programs, you can see that Novo have recently got the EMA marketing approval, so they're actually going to be launching their faster um, Aspart in Europe later this quarter, I believe, is the, mm -hmm. is the time frame. Um, that's quite a bit faster, but it's not massively, not massively, excitingly faster than, um, than the old Nova Log or Nova Rapid. Um, and then the other one that's interesting is what Lily have been doing. They've been working with a French company um, to create what they call bio-chaperoned Lispro. And that's the addition of a couple of, I guess, well, I think it's a couple of proteins. I, I can't remember the detail. It's listed on the on Verbetec. Um, and the initial trials on that are astonishing. I mean, it looks way faster than Humalog and just really, really interesting. So that's that's going to be a very interesting place over the next 18 months or so as we see these new incidents come into play. Mm -hmm. What's it been like for you to be so involved with the CGM in the cloud Facebook group and all, you know, and, and everybody else that's involved around the world, really, with these projects. I, I imagine it's just going to be exciting to be talking with other like-minded people who are so ahead of some of us when it comes to technology. Well, I think it's fair to say that I, I'm really just a user when it comes down to it, but I'm, I'm a user who's been able to get really involved in some of the stuff that goes with it. I, I haven't been involved in any of the development work that's gone into it. And it, massive kudos to those guys, to Scott Dana, um, to Jason Calabrese, Ben West, uh, Milos, Tim Omer. Uh, I haven't got everybody listed there. Wes, Wes, who has 
been behind driving the night scout um, foundation and the cgm in the cloud stuff all of these guys have done a huge amount to to get this stuff there and, and to make sure that it, it's running um i've just been doing stuff to, to to use it and then to share my experiences of using it and to try and help people understand how it works if you like rather than being a key developer of that well and sure and, and your your website though to me seems to be a, a really great comprehensive look at what's available as you say, you're not a developer, but you've become a source for many people with updates and what's going on. Um, what was it like for you? Well, let me ask it this way. What made you think when you looked at all of this without a developer background that, yeah, I could do this? Because uh, I'm not a developer, but I'm a, I'm a technology um, a technophile, let's be honest. And uh, <laughs> my background is, is, is an engineer. So I spent a fair amount of time in my life working within um, a Unix environment, for example. So it's not so far removed from things I've done in the past. Mm. And just picking, it's really a case of picking up and going, right, okay, I can do these things at enough of a level to be able to go away and learn more about it. Um, that was really the reason why I went, yeah, look, I can do this. I can pick it up. I, I have a technology-based background. So... Actually, the next stage of building it, running with it, all of that kind of thing does make it easier, I guess. So it wasn't like I was coming at it from a completely non-technology focus. Right. It's not like me reading the instructions and then saying, well, I don't know what a GitHub is and I have no idea what, you know. Well, no, I didn't know what GitHub was when I started. Oh, come on. <laughs> but having, but having, built, um, having built Unix systems in the past, started. I didn't know how that kind of stuff works and how networking systems work. So I was coming at it from a kind of a technology infrastructure background rather than a, rather than a no technology involvement at all. So there was some, there was, there was a decent enough level in that to, to have made it not such a big step. Well, I like asking those kinds of questions because within the community right now, as you have probably seen, there is a lot of, I guess they would call it that FOMO, you know, that fear of missing out, that many yeah. people, especially a lot of parents, are very concerned that this stuff is out there. They want it, but at the same time, I think, you know, most people are smart enough to know what they don't know because yeah. this isn't something that, while there are wonderful and well-meaning people online, you know, you're basically, at the end of the day, it's you and your child or you and yourself with this equipment. And if something goes wrong, something's going to, something goes wrong. You may not exactly know what you're doing. Could you talk a little bit about, I don't know, I just want to reassure people that it's okay sometimes if you really don't know what you're doing, that the fear of missing out, you know, none of us want to wait. I know that the, the saying for the whole community is we are not waiting, but sometimes it's okay to wait until things are where we need them to be. Or is that, oh. am I not allowed to say that? No, of course, you, that's absolutely right. And that's that's why the FDA signing off on the 670G is great. Yeah. Because what the, if you like, what the We Are Not Waiting movement has achieved is encouraging the regulatory powers to say, actually, this stuff is perhaps safer or more widely used than we'd realized. And therefore, with the commercial companies starting to do it and, and being able to provide full trial data, we are much more comfortable about getting these things signed off. And I, I have to say, if I put my hand up at this point, we are absolutely in the vanguard of doing this stuff. I mean, the fact that you're talking about it, if, if you are looking at this stuff and going, oh my God, I'm overwhelmed by what it takes to pick it up and, and run with it, that's fine. That still probably puts you in the top 10% of knowledge about what is available in the diabetes landscape. If you consider, when you look across the board, that even in the US, 60% of people don't have pump, for example. Um, there is still a significant portion of, of type 1s who run on two injections a day. This stuff's really right at the cutting edge. This isn't, this isn't something that you'd expect everybody to be comfortable picking up and running with. You should you should do what you are comfortable with. And as a parent of a type 1 child, if you are comfortable with, for example, going going onto a, a something like a Mac 
and then compiling a or building a, a piece of code to put on an iPhone, don't worry, you are with the majority of the population. <laughs> it's not like everybody's doing it. I think that's the other side to this, and that is that within social media, the amount of noise is much greater because there is a concentration of those doing this stuff there. And that's kind of not a realistic perspective on, on the world as it is. I think that's a wonderful perspective. Thanks for saying that. And, and Tim, as you said, every major pump company is working on this. Where do you see all of these projects in the next couple of years? I feel like in the next, I don't know, I hate to put numbers on it. I feel like in the next five years, let's be really generous, there will be other options than the Medtronic for a hybrid closed loop. Do you have a, a sense of what may be next for open APS and, and things that are, are more do-it-yourself? Yeah, and I think one of the things that that we see with um, with open APS as it stands at the moment, um, the advanced meal assist piece of functionality is is great. It's an amazing way of managing food, and actually with it, you can get away with not on, on things with small amounts of carbs in, you can get away with not having to bolus. Um, so that's where the insulins we have at the moment. So if you consider that in combination with faster insulins and specifically, I think probably the BC List Pro over the faster Aspart, but I want to get my hands on the faster Aspart as soon as it becomes available. Um, I think we're going to be at a point where effectively you'll be able the open APS stuff, loop as well, um, will have built into the algorithms a mechanism for learning about what happens when you're eating, for example. And I, there's been discussions about how do you include things like accounting for fat and protein, and that's always something that raises a lot of questions because we know how absorption changes with fat and protein. So it's going to be, it's going to be around how eating is managed and how that is more optimized. And if you look at what Bigfoot and Islet have both been talking about, they've been talking about learning algorithms within their systems that allow you to just say, I'm eating a big meal, and then it will handle that. And I think we'll, we'll see that kind of stuff coming out in the open source world as well. And you said you've been living with type 1 for 28 years. Yeah. What, what was it like for you when you were first diagnosed? Obviously, a different world. Um, well, when I was diagnosed, so we're going back to 1988, um, the, really your, um, your only, your insulins were NPH, right. that was your basal insulin, um, and it was just at the onset of the human analogs. So um, when I was diagnosed, what's it called now, I was put onto insulatard um, twice daily, and then as my honeymoon period expired, um, an MDI model using ActRapid and, um, and Insulatard. And I was on that as my MDI model for probably, well, let's see, it would have been probably 15 years. Hmm. Um, and it was only with the introduction of, um, of Lantus and, their, and Novo Rapid that I, was then, I then progressed through to a more effective form of MDI. Um, but even then, it's taken a while, certainly in the UK, it took a while for the whole um, full carb counting and insulin adjustment model to get properly picked up and used by people. And that's taken its time to work its way through. Um, I was fortunate in that when I was diagnosed back in the 80s, the process that we went through at the time used carb counting in association with eating so that we knew how it all hung together and that kind of more or less fed through as I as I progressed. So it's been quite an interesting evolution. I bet. What would you tell your yourself in 1988 that you have now? I mean, it, it just seems to be so different from that... Well, that, that world. It's interesting because I think back to when I was diagnosed and the reality was I didn't not do anything because I'd been diagnosed with type 1. Um, I 
played sport. I played sport a lot, in fact. I still did everything that everybody my age was doing. So I think actually carry on doing that would be my advice to my 13-year-old self. <laughs> Don't let it get in the way of your life. You can do anything you want to. And the fact that there are there are changes, there, there will be changes in the way that you can manage that will just make life a bit easier. But it shouldn't ever get in the way of you living your life and getting on with anything you want to. Yeah, I do think sometimes we forget, and I'm obviously guilty of that, that the technology is really just a way to fine tune it and make it as best that we can. It's not the only way, or by far the majority of the way people handle it. Plenty of people do really well on shots. As you said, it shouldn't stop you from doing anything. Absolutely. I mean, yeah. my, to give you some comparison, um, running on shots, my HbA1c hasn't changed in about two and a half years. I've been In that time, I've been using um, open and closed loop for probably a grand total of nine months um i've used a pump for maybe 15 months and then the rest of that time i was using shots and you can do it with shots you don't have to have the technology as, as i as i've said in the in conversations about it many times as, as we mentioned previously the main thing that the technology does is it enables you to reduce the amount of time you may spend on managing it in the way you, you may have to with shots. Before I start wrapping it up, was there anything that you wanted to make sure to mention, either about any of this technology or about um, yourself? Ooh. That's, <laughs> that's a tricky question. Um, I think, I think in, in terms of technology, it's a case of, if you're interested, take a look at it. If it isn't something you feel that you can embark on doing, don't worry you're with the majority of the population it's it is a step and it can be quite a big step for people but at the same time it's um it's a fascinating one to take and quite a challenging one to take if, if we're honest about it um but just because you can't do it now doesn't mean that in the future you might not come back to it or that you should completely disregard it in terms of what's coming down the line from from people in the future and I think that's the key bit to this. Even if you can't, or you feel you can't do it yourself, there are plenty of things that are coming um, that we know about already that will make it easier and will mean you don't have to do it yourself. Do you think we'll get to a point soon where people don't have to go to MedWow to get old Medtronic pumps? Ah, uh, that's, a, that's a, a loaded question. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it's going to be dependent on on what happens with with pump access. Um, uh, not mentioning particular manufacturer names, but there's obviously um, amongst the various groups work going on to try and crack the Omnipod. Um, there are there's work going on to try and crack the Roche Spirit Combo. Um, I suspect any pump that comes out onto the market that has some form of wireless communication, people will try and crack because they want to have the access and the ability to choose their own algorithm to manage their diabetes. And there will always be a community of people who are interested in doing that. Definitely. And then one question that I'm asking all of my guests this year um, is, what is your advice for someone who is newly diagnosed, a family or, a, or an adult who's newly diagnosed with type 1, what would you say to them? Um, what I said earlier, type 1 isn't you, it isn't who you are, it isn't everything that you have to do. Type 1 is simply a part of you. It's like being a brother or a mother or a photographer. You, are, you also have diabetes. The most important thing is to not stop it, sorry, not allow it to stop you from living your life and doing anything you want to do. It's not something now in this day and age that should ever make your life restricted. 
Tim, thank you so much for sharing some time with me. I, I really appreciate it. Again, it's um, it's kind of hard for me sometimes to keep up on all the, the technology, and you did a wonderful job of kind of explaining it for my audience. But I'm, I'm just really excited about all this. I think it's amazing. Uh, it, it's brilliant. It, it's the fact that we have this choice, and the choice is carry on doing what you want to do, so what you're doing, the fact that you can choose to do something different and amazing, and that's, that's the the most amazing part of it. If you go back two or three years, we didn't have choice. It was a pump or MDI, that was it. Now, look what you can do. You're listening to Diabetes Connections with Stacy Sims. I always get so hopeful when I talk to people like Tim or Dana Lewis, who we talked about, I mentioned in during the interview for the episode on Open APS, which I will link up, but I'll be honest with you, um, that's probably a bit out of date because we did that interview early on in the podcast. So I got to catch up with Dana and get the latest and greatest from her. But, you know, as you heard, I don't plan on doing this myself or grabbing this technology and, and putting it on my son, mostly because... I'm not comfortable with a pump that's out of warranty. I'm also not comfortable with my level of expertise. I mean, yeah, you know, my son could probably do it a lot better than I could. So maybe when he gets a little older, if, if the stuff isn't to market yet. But I, I do really feel like the this community pushed the manufacturers and pushed the FDA and, and has really shown what is safe and what is possible um, in diabetes management. And I think we're getting there it's still too slow, right? I mean, none of us want to wait for any of this, but it's coming. So thanks so much to Tim for taking the time to explain. And I will have a lot more to come in the weeks to come here on Diabetes Connections on many more of these methods and on, you know, what's happening from the manufacturers as Medtronic comes out with their hybrid closed loop in just a couple of weeks. In the meantime, please consider donating to Spare a Rose. Again, talking about all this high-tech stuff is great, but there are so many needs within our diabetes community, and it's not just in this country. Yeah, we're all worried about what's going to happen with healthcare. I know that. And if you're pinching your pennies to pay for your own diabetes management, I, I get that too. I mean, this is pretty serious stuff. But if you have what you need and you can spare a little bit more, consider donating to Spare a Rose. Just go to diabetes-connections.com and you will get, for just a little bit of money, life-saving basics to kids in the developing world where type 1 can be a death sentence. So let's do what we can for them. Again, it's Diabetes Podcast Week as well, so I will be promoting a lot of other shows. There are some great podcasts out there. Um, I will have links at diabetes-connections.com, and you can check out other podcasts, maybe find somebody that you'd love to connect with, and go ahead and listen to them. Of course, come on back and, and listen to us here as well. Please subscribe on whatever podcast app you're listening. Take a moment to sign up for the newsletter. And thank you so much for being part of Diabetes Connections. I'm Stacey Sims, and I'll see you back here next week. Diabetes Connections is a production of Stacey Sims Media. All rights reserved, all wrongs avenged.